Uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, thanks for coming. Um, this particular uh, session is being sponsored by CANNOR and the Aboriginal Affairs Northern Canada, or ANSI, I guess it's called now. Thank you, sponsors. Um, we have uh, three presenters today, or this morning, and we have, the, uh, they have different perspectives on what they're going to say. We have a uh, one presenter uh, from one of the land claim groups, Makovic, will talk about, uh, from their perspective, how economic development is done in the north. Then we have a, a private uh, company that's going to give their perspective. And then the last one is from the government of Nunavut and give their perspective. So there's three distinct uh, presentations. So the first person to, to speak will be uh, Michael Gordon. Uh, Michael comes from Kujuak. He's the vice president of Makovic uh, Corporation. He's the uh, director, or, yeah, I mean, excuse me, vice president of economic development. Um, Michael's been around for a long time. Michael, sort of. But he, he started, uh, he's been elected to the executive of Makovic back in 2007. Before that, Michael used to be the uh, mayor of Kujuak. I think he'd done that for four terms, Michael? Eight, eight years. So he's got perspective from the community level, and he's got perspective from um, the, uh, the regional level. Michael was born in Fort Chip a few years ago. I'm not going to give his age. Um, he went to high school in Kujuak and went on to, uh, for further studies at McGill University and received his degree in political science. He returned to, uh, after university, returned to Kujuak and then became the assistant to the mayor, and then he ran for the mayor and became the mayor for four terms, eight years. Then uh, he ran for the executive um, for, for Makovic, but he's also, before that, was on the board. He became um, the uh, vice president of economic development. He also served as the vice chair of the Katavec Regional Government and also the Katavec uh, Environmental Quality Commission. He's also a member of the Land Holding Corporation in uh, Kujuak, um, and he's got a lifetime interest in politics, uh, both at the local level and the regional level. And he's also really uh, interested in terms of the land, the land claim agreement, how to increase economic opportunity for the uh, Inuit who live in Anunavik, which is northern Quebec. Michael uh, scratched out a part of his uh, bio, but I'm going to give it anyway. He's got four children, and, and he, he's heavily involved in anything to do with land-based activities. Michael. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Wave uh, with your right hand. Right hand. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> I've got uh, a few slides and I'll be going through them. Hopefully uh, I remember what I wrote down. Uh, I'm sure the slides will uh, jog my memory. Actually the last past few days have been very good for me. I had a lot of fun meeting uh, old friends, making new acquaintances. Uh, it was a uh, I stay away from parties, uh, they're not so good for the next morning. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, here goes. I'll start by introducing our region. You probably know uh, the Nunavik region. Nunavik is the, the area north of the 55th parallel in the province of uh, Quebec. It covers about 505,000 square kilometers. Um, I like to think of it as the better half of uh, Quebec. Uh, it is uh, a population of about, we have a population of approximately 12,000 people. Actually, I think I'm actually too close to this. And uh, most of the population is uh, comprised of Inuit. Uh, we have uh, roughly 60% of the population is under the age of 25. So we have a very young population. We're tax-paying citizens, and we have a very high cost of living in, uh, in Nunavik. 
something uh, that you have to be aware of, we have no road links to the south, and when we say the south, it means uh, Montreal and Ottawa uh, and the outlying area. So we're dependent on airlines and uh, sea lift. The Nunavik economy, tra traditionally it's been a hunting and gathering economy, but today it's a combination of uh, the traditional, the wage economy and the business sector. Today we have a few, very few full-time hunters, hunters, but many part-time hunters, weekend hunters, we like to call ourselves. And uh, it costs money to hunt, so you have to pretty much have a job in order to go hunting. The traditional economy is still vital to the Nunavik family. We depend heavily on uh, food from the land. Uh, the production of clothing, our mainly women, are, are good seamstresses. They provide uh, winter clothing. Summer clothing we usually usually get from uh, what used to be Zellers, Target, maybe Northern. And uh, the arts and crafts community is a uh, is a vibrant community, and it, it provides supplemental income to our people. Uh, for our artists. Uh, a recent trend has been the growth of Inuit-owned businesses and more recently it's been uh, the servicing of, uh, mine, of the mining sector which has grown incrementally in the past few years. Makivik Corporation is a key player in building and developing Nunavik and has been doing that since the 1970s. We're mandated to protect the rights and the culture of Inuit. We administer the funds provided by the James Bay Agreement, signed in 1975, uh, the Senate Agreement, signed uh, in 2002, and uh, the offshore land claim, signed in, in 2008. Uh, we're also mandated to relieve poverty and to promote the welfare and advancement of uh, Inuit. Makibi Corporation, how do we meet our, our economic and socio-economic ob objectives? We invest in the capital market, markets, we create businesses, so we have a number of subsidiaries and uh, joint ventures. Uh, we provide jobs to our beneficiaries through our group of companies, and I'll be talking about that a little later on. We have uh, quite a few socioeconomic projects in the region. We assist uh, in community projects and in infrastructures. The, as I mentioned earlier, the traditional economy is still very important for Nunavik. Uh, we're conducting a research project on the traditional economy. We'd like to, a we'd like to be able to measure how much how much, uh, actually we'd like to be able to measure and put a dollar value on how much food gets put on the Nunavik family's table. Uh, and once we know that, we'd like to know how much sharing is still happening. And, we, and after we have the results, we'd like to use the information to adapt some of our programs. The show, social economy in Nunavik it's still a crucial aspect, it is a crucial aspect uh, to Nunavik and it continues to grow. To grow. Uh, examples include daycares, the co-op stores, artistic workshops, food kitchens. We also provide uh, taxation services for our people. Uh, we fill out the income taxes and uh, hope they get the best return that they can get. Not only do, do they provide important services to our communities, but they also create import, in, employment. Example, the daycares, they provide uh, employment to our region, to our population. And they're very important in uh, adding to the human, human capital of our region. It frees up uh, the, man, the, the father and the mother uh, to do other work. We have a number of subsidiaries 
We own Air Inuit. Uh, it was the first subsidiary create, created in 1978 by Makivik, our first subsidiary. And it's been profitable in the past few years, but early on it was uh, very difficult for Air Inuit and Makivik. If you don't know Air Inuit, it provides passenger, cargo, and charter services to all of Nunavik and, and to some southern uh, locales, especially Montreal. It employs over 600 uh, people. It's important. It's an important economic engine in Nunavik. It fulfills social responsibilities in our region, in our communities. First Air is another company we own. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of ours. It's a major carrier in Canada's Arctic. It makes the important link between southern Canada and the north. Makivik purchased First Air in 1990. And just like Erie Nuit, it, it wasn't very profitable at first, but uh, years later it became uh, quite profitable. But it's got its own challenges today. First Air uh, provides over a thousand jobs all across the north. We have some joint ventures, I'll get into these, but very briefly. Nunavut Eastern Arctic Shipping, NIAS. It provides maritime sh shipping services to Nunavik and Nunavut. We have uh, four vessels. It employs up to 150, 150 staff seasonally. And uh, we have equity on the ships. We have an equity stake on the ships. We own, uh, so if we were to sell them in the future, we'd uh, hopefully make money off of them. And we make, uh, make sure that Inuit are staffed or Inuit are on the ships when they make it to the shores of uh, Nunavik and Nunavut. Uh, many Inuit are more comfortable speaking Inuktitut uh, when they're picking up their cargo on the, the beaches of, uh, of the north. So we make a point of uh, hiring Inuit uh, to work on each ship. Nasituk, or Pan-Arctic Inuit Logistics, is another venture. <coughs> that we're part of. Uh, we work with uh, three other Inuit groups in Canada. Unak Fisheries, it's a jointly owned, uh, it's jointly owned with Hikitara Corporation out of Nunavut. And uh, it's, uh, we, how, how does it, how should I say this? We own a fishing license with Hikitara Corporation and we get it fished by uh, our contractor, uh, Clearwater. We also have uh, another license under the Makivik, under Makivik Corporation, which we, which we own uh, fully. And we uh, <coughs> use Newfound Resources to fish uh, our license. And it, the shrimping fisheries has been very profitable for Makivik in the past, and we hope it continues in the future. And we've been employing Inuit as shrimp fishermen since the 1980s. Very quickly, we have uh, other wholly owned subsidiaries. They don't always make money. Some of them haven't made money, but I'll just list them anyways. Uh, Nunavik Creations, which we're proud of. Nuna Sail Incorporated, uh, we provide cell phone services in Nunavik. And we partner with uh, people from uh, the Naskapi from Kawachikamach in a roundabout way. We have uh, two construction companies, one of them, uh, Kautak Construction and uh, the Makivik Construction Division. Uh, Kautak is for profit, the other one uh, not for profit, so we build houses for in Nunavik uh, and try to have a very small margin just to break even so that we make more houses uh, than, than what the money would allow for. We also own a fuel distribution center in Kutrak, Halutic Fuel. We have a mapping service uh, through Makovic Geomatics. There are many challenges and opportunities. Of course, there's Arctic conditions to contend with. Like I said, we have transport issues. 
and the high cost of living and doing business in the north, in Nunavik. We need to work on the human capacity. Education levels are not as, not as high as we'd like them to be. And not everyone goes back to school, so we need uh, more on-the-job training opportunities. There's a high turnover of employees. So there's many areas in the human capacity that we have to work on. And of course, being in the north, we're in the small markets, so the cell phone company that we own uh, doesn't thrive as much as maybe the cell phone companies in the south would. There are limited resources of uh, financial for, for financial capital, especially for our businesses. Uh, government programs are, are often not suited to northern realities. And our challenge is to make sure more of our people enter and remain a part of the Nunavik economy. Another challenge or opportunity on the horizon is that of mining. I don't know how I'm doing with the time, okay? Another challenge or opportunity is that of mining. Uh, many companies are looking to the north. Apparently, the rocks and the land we walk on have iPads and iPad screens, maybe, or the components to make those iPad, iPad screens. Uh, so we're not sure if we should be treading lightly on the land or not, but apparently there's a lot of uh, minerals to be had in uh, our region as well. Mining can be good and mining could be bad. Uh, it has to be sustainable. The land and the waters have su sustained our people for millennia, so we have to make sure that they don't just get destroyed. And we, are, we understand that the mining industry tries its best and uh, looks at uh, social acceptable, acceptability. So we work with the mining industry as much as we can. And, and today there's a, a bit of a debate between our people as to whether or not we want mining to go, mining to go ahead and destroy some of the land and the lakes. Uh, that's an ongoing issue uh, presently. Mining companies, we understand they're, in, they're there, they're in business to make money. So any business is in business to make money. So we understand that part as well. They're there to make money for the shareholders. So we have to accept the pros and the cons when it comes to mining before minings can go ahead before more mines can go ahead in uh, Nunavik. Impact benefits agreements. Makivik represents the population of Nunavik in negotiations with mining companies. We've signed two IBAs in the past, one uh, with Raglan Mine in 1995, the other one, I believe around 2008, give or take a year. Uh, it's with Canadian Royalties and uh, Nunavik Nickel. Mines provide much needed jobs, although there are impacts on the land and the animals. Everyone knows that. Uh, we're presently not negotiating an IBA with any of the mining companies, but many are sort of uh, knocking on the door, making contacts with us. And uh, There's a, a couple working on their impact uh, environmental impact statements and after that we may get into a negotiation process with them and this could be in six months or a year or two uh, down the road. For future projects we have to maximize the benefits to the Nunavik economy and to our people while at the same time limiting the negative impacts. That's obvious. Well pillars to the economic development in Nunavik of course we need a healthy population we need good education, not just in higher education, but also in the, the trades, in the vocations. Housing, we need proper housing, and many of uh, our people are living in over, overcrowded houses, which can impact on the health and the education of our, our youth. We need more access to capital, and there's a shortage of infrastructures in the north. 
uh, Suzanne Pockhain was here or the next room a couple of days ago talking about NIAS and she mentioned that there are no safe harbors in the, the Arctic. That's one area and there's uh, quite a number of other areas where we need infrastructure in the north. Uh, just to conclude, Makkabi Corporation would like to work with the business community and governments to grow the Nunavik economy. We're always looking for new ventures and joint venture partners. We're ready to face the future. Challenges can be turned into opportunities. And uh, I'd like everyone to remember that every Inuk uh, wants to be a good provider, whether it be in, uh, in hunting, in business, or in the wage economy. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, appreciate your uh, honesty in terms of talking about the realities. As you mentioned, some of the, your entities didn't make money at first, but now they are. So you guys must do something right. Uh, the next presenter uh, is uh, from the private sector, but he always works, does a lot of work uh, in the north. Stefan Reikak. Uh, he's with Stratus. 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 Excuse me. It's a tongue twister for me. Um, Basically, it's a consulting firm that's based in uh, working with the, with the environment and look, looking at uh, the economic opportunities that exist. Uh, Stefan has worked uh, in, with the natural resource sector, both from, the, from a company's point of view and from an industrial association point of view, doing studies um, and looking at different strategies and, and how to make things work. Uh, he, could, he contributed to the, this is a long one, the, Na, the NASA Roundtable on the environment and the economy. I'm not sure that's still existing now or not. It's gone. Um, and they've done a lot of work uh, with, with the mining in, in terms of uh, drainage and looking at uh, the center of accuracy for um, the mining innovations, for climate change impact on, on northern mining, and carbon pricing, and the, the use of, of life cycle approaches to government decision making. Um, Michael actually started, excuse me, Michael, Savan started his career working in Northern Ontario uh, and then he, he moved on to work, work in the North in sustainable um, types of uh, businesses and he's looking at, has, has worked with the, uh, the federal government on, the, on management of abandoned mine sites and dew line sites, people agree with dew lines, uh, looked at issues around climate change and recent approaches to uh, national development. Uh, Stefan is uh, an engineer uh, with degrees from on Toronto and University of Waterloo. Stefan. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. It's a great conference and uh, I've enjoyed meeting people over the past few days. Um, I just wanted to do a, a quick poll of the room actually. Um, thanks again for coming out on a Saturday morning. Um, I didn't realize that I was speaking on Saturday at first and was kind of shocked, oh, we're going into the weekend. Um, so maybe, um, we could see a show of hands on uh, folks representing industry. Great, and um, uh, how about government? And uh, community leaders? Uh, Non-governmental organizations? And um, consultants? <laughs> Leave them till the end. I'm one of those too. <laughs> All right, great. I'm not gonna necessarily on the fly customize my presentation to meet the profile, but good to know uh, who's in the audience. So today uh, I'd like to speak to um, evolving approaches to natural resource development planning in the north. Um, this won't be a talk on land use planning uh, per se. Um, 
I'm not an expert in that and it's a giant challenging topic. Um, so I'm just going to scratch the surface on a few issues, um, um, hopefully some issues that, uh, that show uh, some newness and innovation in this area. And when we think about uh, planning, uh, in general, we, we think about a process of, of people coming together, um, identifying problems, setting goals, uh, some kind of vision for often a, a longer term period into the future, and then figuring out a series of steps to, uh, to, to reach those goals. Um, from a stakeholder perspective, governments are often involved in developing these plans. And, um, and when we're talking about natural resource development, I'm thinking mining and oil and gas, and perhaps in the context of the regions that are represented at this conference, um, I'm making the focus a bit more on, on the mining aspect, although I'll draw from various areas. From a community point of view, uh, communities have visions, they may have economic development plans, and they may or may not be brought into government planning processes for, for better or for worse. And industry is focused on individual projects and they seek to influence government policy and planning to maximize their opportunities. And again, they may be also engaged in a planning process. So, uh, Ron has kindly described briefly what Stratos is and why we care about this. Um, we are a, a management consulting firm, essentially, that specializes in, in environmental, uh, social, and economic risks and opportunities, and we work with governments and associations and businesses to help them address those. And our work has focused on the mining and energy sectors. And uh, a good part of our work has been in the north, especially in our public sector practice. And uh, as Ron mentioned as well, uh, I have, and along with my colleagues, worked a lot on, on some of the contaminated site legacy issues in the north. And this definitely provides a motivation for exploring ways and helping organizations implement new ways of doing things to avoid those those legacies and do things in a better way. Hope some of you can read this in the back. I'm really it's perhaps a little bit small. These are a few news clips from uh, from recent headlines and also some important reports dealing with this area. And we see a combination from these headlines of a Sometimes a lack of pro progress, some success stories, lessons learned that demonstrate an understanding of evolving challenges. So some of the messages from these news headlines include um, development not moving forward uh, due to inadequate understanding and assessment of regional dimensions and, and impacts, dysfunctional processes where regional and bigger picture issues are debated within the assessments of individual projects to, to the great frustration of many. Um, a recognition and a desire from a range of stakeholders for government to step up to the plate in terms of being um, an efficient regulator with, significant, with sufficient capacity to be a facilitator of partnerships and a funding partner potentially. And I think a general belief that there, are, there is potential for so-called win-win scenarios where government, industry, and communities and civil society can at least be aligned on the types of processes that are used to make decisions on development. Resource extraction has happened and continues to happen all over our, our country. Um, however, there are areas that represent um, sort of a, a, a more formidable challenge than others um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of planning. Um, and these are regions where, where there's high, high resource potential and 
opportunities for, for many communities and many companies, um, but that are also located in, in valued, highly valued and, and largely untouched ecosystems with, uh, with little infrastructure and where communities are currently struggling from a socioeconomic point of view. So on this map, we, I've just pointed out a few and my apologies to if you're within a region that's not represented here, but um, I'd just point out West Katikmi as an example of a, of a region with high potential uh, major infrastructure gaps. It, it kind of epitomizes a few of these things that I talked about. We are slowly honing in on better assessment and decision-making processes, learning from successes and mistakes, sometimes taking two steps forward, one step back. Um, there is, of course, as shown on this timeline, a long history of traditional decision and planning-making processes, some of which in some cultures are very holistic, consider future generations and a wide range of aspects. In more recent history, we've got a, uh, an alphabet soup of, uh, of developments, and sorry, I, don't exp I couldn't fit all of them in those boxes, um, but uh, a number of sort of landmark um, legal frameworks, uh, decisions, reports that, that move towards the formalization of the inclusion of traditional knowledge and practices. Um, the use of an application of free prior informed consent, um, land use planning uh, moving forward, hopefully evolving, and more recently some, some no notable examples of regional processes like LARP, which is the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, and uh, uh, BRIA, the Beaufort Regional Environmental Assessment. Uh, those last two focusing on particular types of development too, in those cases, oil and gas. So in general, we see a movement uh, in terms of geographical scope going from local site impacts to consideration of more regional and cumulative effects. In terms of issues, looking uh, not only at purely environmental impacts, but also socioeconomic and cultural. And finally, um, Ideally, in terms of decision-making power moving from sort of centralized control in the federal government and industry influence to empowering communities, the people who live on the land, and with devolution, the movement of uh, decision-making power to the north. Now, despite this evolution in tools and concepts, there remain significant challenges in defining and, and realizing uh, this elusive goal of sustainable natural resource development. Very briefly, this is perhaps an evolved version of a mining life cycle. Uh, this figure comes from Natural Resources Canada. And here we see the familiar project phases along the bottom of the, of the figure, bracketed by land use planning at the very beginning, post-closure activities at the end. And above each phase, we have ongoing engagement and monitoring activities to address socioeconomic opportunities and to, uh, and to control environmental impacts. Now when we look at a region, things get significantly more complicated. We would have many of those mining life cycles happening in parallel, concurrently, and at different stages. where we face challenges around human resource capacity for projects, we have to keep in mind the timelines for investments in education and when those bear results. We've got where there are infrastructure gaps in a region, the infrastructure development life cycle, and I believe my colleagues will probably, colleague will probably speak to that in a moment. Um, not only in terms of the technical challenge of building infrastructure, but the governance and partnership arrangements that are required for shared infrastructure in, in a natural resource development region. Timeframes about engagement and consultation, especially if we are looking to achieve sort of the higher degrees of social license to operate, 
not just acceptance and approval, but moving towards pride and ownership of development initiatives. And then finally, global phenomena, um, climate change, which is disproportionately impacting the issues that were uh, the areas that we're concerned with here, and of course, uh, market forces. An ideal planning and decision-making sequence might look like this, and much of this is probably familiar to, to most of you. Settling outstanding land claims and other Aboriginal rights issues. That was started a while back and is ongoing. Reaching preliminary consensus that mining or oil and gas development provides an acceptable and desired form of economic development. Michael just spoke briefly to some of the pros and cons there. Land use planning, I guess in a nutshell, having a framework for what can happen where and how. <clears throat> Regional cumulative effects assessments, we've been involved both with the SIMP program in NWT and the NGMP in Nunavut, having some kind of framework for monitoring baselines and measuring impacts as they happen. Community assessments, sometimes known as preparedness or readiness assessments and community well-being studies, and other regional scale engagement processes to address specific uh, constraints, again, infrastructure gaps, human resources, education, and training. So in the best circumstances, these all take place before specific projects move through the regulatory process. However, in most cases in Canada, or in many cases in Canada, we have situations where these ideal steps are out of sequence or uh, are not done as well as they could be, and we're playing some catch up. It's not a perfect world. I'd like to focus the remainder of my talk on the last two steps. Um, we think that there are opportunities in these last two steps to to, um, to compensate for some of the gaps or shortcomings in the earlier steps, uh, to perhaps be a bit more responsive to particular types of communities and initiatives and regions and sub-regions. Community assessments. Um, as I mentioned before, these may go under various names and have slightly different objectives, but we can talk about community preparedness, community readiness, or well-being assessments, and, and we see these as, as initiatives to uh, build knowledge and capacity for informed decision-making and the capacity for communities to fully benefit from resource development. New development potential and specific projects proposals invite us to uh, consider these assessments perhaps with a bit more focus um, and to be a bit more specific and to drive towards um, solutions and actions uh, that are geared towards consideration of particular proposals. Um, the sponsor of, of this session, uh, Canor, has been doing some work in this area in West Katikmia and is starting in other regions and that's um, very, very interesting work um, that is engaging, uh, doing community-specific um, assessments and at the same time coordinating, coordinating this with a number of actors in the region, including industry and government. Um, a process that, um, that I've had a lot of experience with has been the um, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, which is currently looking for a community to uh, host a deep underground repository for Canada's nuclear waste. It's a bit of a different context compared to mining in that it um, they're looking at different communities versus having the location predetermined by a mineral resource and only being able to go there. Um, but they are, uh, doing some very interesting uh, work in terms of community well-being assessments that are um, empowering and providing funds to communities to examine their own direction.
Um, in some communities, these assessments may need to start at a very basic level in terms of es establishing essential needs on what's needed to even move further into the process. And then uh, moving along further, like in the NWMO model, uh, providing them with the support to do visioning strategic plans which can help them consider and maximize their opportunities on specific natural resource developments, but also something that they can carry forward into other aspects of their social and economic planning. Um, looking at it more broadly from other stakeholder points of view, this might inform how a government may coordinate its services in the area or for a specific community. And as corporations move from sort of buying jerseys for hockey teams as part of their community investment to more strategic community investment, nothing against supporting a hockey team, of course, but um, this type of process can really help identify those areas where a private sector actor can assist a community in dealing with um, some of the gaps identified in, in an assessment. And as I mentioned, I think a key benefit here and one that has really been demonstrated by this um, nuclear waste process that I'm more familiar with is communities coming out of this with a benefit from the process that's quite separate from the eventual outcome of a natural resource development or of the project in that case. Do I have a couple more minutes? Okay. Whoa. Um, The other aspect I wanted to touch on is regional dialogues. Um, and together with this, I, I'll mention early engagement. Um, as community and stakeholder expectations grow, the value of early engagement is being increasingly demonstrated. It's no longer a nice to do. It's becoming a, a key element of success for a lot of companies. I won't go into the details of the example of Avalon in, in Northwest Territories, but um, and not saying it was a perfect process, but quite exemplary and well documented on the internet in terms of what they were able to, to achieve in engaging communities, both with and without claims, casting a fairly wide net of who they talk to, and uh, engaging before land use permit applications, before renewals, etc. We would propose that at a regional level, early engagement is also very important because of the uh, unique uh, barriers that exist in northern regions. So dealing with cumulative impacts and traditional activities, you know, where a caribou migration area and calving ground covers most of the region in question, it's essential that there be a regional lens on addressing those types of impacts. And also the nature of infrastructure, it crosses entire regions, affects various communities, and uh, also requires um, many partners around the table to decide how to move forward. Also for the companies who may, on a project by project basis, not be able to afford the inf infrastructure investment on, on their own and have to work with other company partners um, and government to have co-investment schemes. In terms of new approaches, there are some really inspiring examples. Uh, one that I, in fact, just learned about yesterday when I listened to the president of uh, Makovic speak at lunch was the uh, Paknasi Mautic um, process that happened in Nunavut. Uh, this is an example of a community-driven regional dialogue and um, assessment uh, consultation process um, that happened in all communities. and and uh, looks like a very inspiring process. I think the results are gonna be coming out shortly on that. Um, looking at the role of government in such things, there's a lot to be said for uh, producing engagement protocols and, and uh, frameworks for equity participation, and there's some really good examples that exist perhaps in the northern regions of some of the provinces. So. Uh, Alberta is currently struggling with this, perhaps not an example to follow, but BC has provided, uh, has sort of stepped out in front a bit more and have been assisting uh, industry with engagement. 
And then I'll just mention briefly uh, sort of social media and technological innovation. Social media will be key for engaging youth. <clears throat> and uh, I myself uh, follow a number of um, uh, blogs written by Aboriginal people. And it seems to me, I don't have the numbers, but that um, uh, a lot of young Aboriginal folks are really involved with, with uh, the blogosphere and uh, engaging on issues in that medium. So that's not something that we can ignore. The University of Waterloo has is doing computer modeling at looking at regional assessments and assessing governments, governance frameworks for, for resource development as well. So there, there's a lot happening sort of in the social media and computer modeling sphere in this area too. Last slide. I'll just leave you with a few questions and key considerations. Um, I'm not going to read them right now, but um, that, that sums things up. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, as mentioned at the beginning, we had three distinct uh, presentations. So, uh, uh, Michael's was talking about what's happened in his region, and you're talking globally, it was great. And now we're going to move to a, a government perspective, and we have Tony Bird that's going to go up and say a few words. Right, Tony? <laughs> uh, Tony's the uh, senior advisor of the uh, Department of uh, Economic Development and Transportation, the Governor Nunavut. He's the business uh, advisor. Uh, Tony has spent the last 22 years in business management and working um, as an executive and also working as, as, in a consulting position. The past four and a half years, he's worked for the public sector, uh, worked for the government of Nunavut. Tony has a career in his background is in information management systems and technology. He has been involved with industry, industry solutions to technology for manufacturing, wholesale, wholesale distribution, uh, supply chain management. Um, he also has a, 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 a deep knowledge uh, in the whole thing about business and public sector uh, when it comes to uh, programs, legislation, and policies. Um, Tony is a graduate of the University of Manitoba, has a BA in psychology and economics. He's also a graduate of the MAI, uh, basic four in EMC Corporation, as a certified career development and program covering uh, business administration and marketing. Tony. You don't have to have Tony what MAI is. I don't know what it is. Well, Abdul, good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow speakers, event organizers, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. <clears throat> uh, this presentation is going to uh, cover economic development opportunities in Nunavut with an emphasis on labor force skills development. <clears throat> the uh, two million square kilometers of Nunavut comprises 20% uh, of Canada's geography and has a population of 35,000, dispersed amongst 24 coastal communities, plus one inland community, which is Baker Lake. <coughs> Just for comparison, this is uh, this 2,000 square, 2 million square kilometers, rather, is um, equivalent to uh, Mexico or Greenland, and one fifth of Canada's area. Inuktitut is the first language of 70% of Nunavumiat. Uh, the territory's estimated GDP of 2.2 billion, uh, was in 2013. Today's presentation is going to cover strategies, the state of economic development in Nunavut, uh, workforce training, sectors, financial contribution programs, and uh, outlook for long-term prosperity. Strategies key to the economic development and future prosperity of Nunavut include mining, transportation, fisheries, energy, tourism, arts and crafts, a multi-stakeholder uh, collaborative effort is also underway 
to renew the Nunavut Economic Development Strategy. This is called NEDS 2, Nunavut Economic Development Strategy 2. It's a 10 year strategy. Uh, priority areas for uh, economic development include mining, construction, fisheries, information communications technology, telecom, tourism, arts and crafts, and uh, large scale developments. <coughs> Nunavut has a uh, a wealth of resources, a growing economy, breathtaking landscapes, and a unique culture to share with the rest of the world. Building a strong and sustainable economy in Nunavut is, fundamental, is a fundamental objective of the government of Nunavut. Uh, in, in the near term, mining is the most significant economic uh, opportunity. Fostering robust, a robust exploration and mining industry is central to the Nunavut economic development strategy. The goal of, uh, of the mining strategy is to create conditions for a strong minerals industry that contributes to a sustainable and high quality of life in all 25 communities of Nunavut. Nunavut is divided into three regions, Kitikmit to the west, Kivalik to the uh, central south, and Kikitalik to the east and north. Kikitalik is also known as, as the Baffin region. So Nunavut Mining Strategy identifies four pillars, jurisdictional, community, infrastructure, and environment. Companies involved in Nunavut's mining projects that are in, uh, in production or advanced uh, feasibility stages include Agnigo Eagle Mines, Meadowbank Gold, Arkwar Mittel, Mary River, Iron Ore, Reaver Resources, Kigavik, Uranium, again, Eagle Nickel, Agnigo Eco Mines again, Maladine, Gold, Extrata Zinc Canada, Hackett River, Zinc, Silver, uh, Peregrine Diamonds in the Chidliac Project. This table, uh, courtesy of the Chamber of Mines, shows various mining activities in more detail going on around Nunavut. Uh, the Chamber has a very informative uh, website named miningnorth.com. More mining projects at various stages of exploration and feasibility analysis. Upcoming and uh, promising Nunavut mining opportunities uh, for base and precious metals in the scoping study stage include <clears throat> excuse me, Sabina Gold and Silver Corp, Back River for Gold, M MMG Resources, Isaac Corridor for Zinc and Copper, Elgin Mining, Lupin for Gold, and Hope Bay for Gold. It has been optimistically said by the uh, Nunavut Chamber of Commerce, uh, sorry, Chamber of Mines, I should say, that there is potential for Nunavut mine projects to be contributing up to $20 billion to the territory's annual GDP uh, within 20 to 30 years. So very significant growth, uh, quite a, that would be quite an increase over the present G GDP value of Nunavut, which is $2.2 billion. EDT works with, uh, the Department of Economic Development and Transportation works with Many stakeholders, including the GN Department of Education, the Government of Canada, and uh, mining and exploration industries, uh, on a number of programs designed to inform and train Nunavumiat uh, to participate in opportunities in the mining industry. EDT programs and initiatives include the Nunavut High School Math and Science Awards Program, the Independent Science Program for the North, the Mineral Exploration Field Assistance Course through Nunavut Arctic College and careers in mining school and community presentations. The Kivlik region is experiencing a resource boom with the uh, Meadowbank uh, mine in operation, the Melodine project in development, and the Kigavik project at the environmental assessment stage. Here's the Meadowbank gold mine in Baker Lake. Production drilling at Meadowbank. With construction of Mary River Mine, uh, North Baffin Island, well underway, Baffin Land, 50% owned by Arkelor Mittel, is helping uh, potential local employees to understand the nature of the challenges that individuals and families may face due to a fly-in, fly-out work schedule. A variety of mine training initiatives are in place, as you can see. Every year, ED&T uh, geologists present a six-day introduction to prospecting course to interested residents and communities throughout the territory. Each community has the course delivered every three or four years. Since 2000, the courses have been held across Nunavut with uh, 
More than 800 graduates to date. The introductory prospecting course introduces people to basic prospecting skills. Many graduates have applied to the Nunavut Prospectors Program for funding to start their own projects. And additionally, graduates of the course often obtain work as uh, field ass assistants in uh, exploration projects. Um, Kivalk Mine Training Society, through a partnership between the, uh, the Government of Canada, ed and and private sector, KMTS is deploying a plan for community engagement and job awareness, uh, job readiness training, uh, work experience, and skills training and trades qualification. <clears throat> Uh, hiring goals are to attract, develop, and retain qualified personnel with emphasis on uh, workplace safety and protection of the environment. Um, the Kitikimit, uh, the Kitikimit Inuit Association partners with NWT Mining, Mine Training Society to have mine industry related training delivered to Nunavut in the Kitikimit region. The uh, mineral exploration and mining industries have the potential to contribute significant and sustainable business benefits to Nunavut, including infrastructure, jobs, education skills, career development, and local business opportunities. Economic development, however, also has socioeconomic impacts, which could include wealth management, uh, loss of traditional lifestyle, and increased stress on already struggling community infrastructure. It is essential that strong and functional relationships uh, between developers, government, and communities be established to manage impacts and uh, manage benefits to ensure that the uh, development of Nunavut's mineral resources are beneficial to Nunavut. Infrastructure development. Uh, advantage must be taken of opportunities to improve and build infrastructure so that developments in one sector of the uh, economy provide broad benefits throughout other economic sectors. A strong sustainable mining industry will have operating mines throughout the territory providing employment and business opportunities. A high level of exploration activity will result in new mineral uh, discoveries and developments with new mines coming into production as older mines are closed and uh, reclaimed. The Arctic ecosystem is fragile. Um, the two-year diploma environmental technology program from Nunavut Arctic College has proven very successful in meeting the growing demands for environmental practitioners. Uh, compared to other jurisdictions, uh, Canada and most jurisdictions in the, in the, in the world, Nunavut is a, is a high cost area for mineral exploration and development, uh, lack of knowledge about the geology of the territory, lack of a road network, and uh, challenging climate uh, combined to increase project costs and uh, planning timelines. Recognizing the high cost uh, environment and high risk nature of exploration and development, in industry requested that the territorial tax structure be reviewed to ensure it is fair and equitable. Oil and gas, although remote and difficult to access, Nunavut is estimated to have up to 25% of Canada's oil and gas resources. Now, at present, with the, uh, with the advent of new drilling technologies and recent discoveries of new shale gas deposits, the, at present, this has contributed to an oversupply and, uh, and some slumping demand in the, uh, in the North American market. Opportunities for large-scale developments exist in Nunavut for airports, roads, ports, communications, and power. Airports. The federal government is contributing $77 million towards uh, a 300 million uh, P3 airport improvement project for the Cowlitz International Airport. The new uh, transportation strategy described Rankin Inlet Airport as, although paved and long enough for most narrow body aircraft, it needs an improved approach to assist landings in poor weather, plus an undersized and congested apron. Um, Cambridge Bay Airport is described as having 5,000 foot gravel runway only, suited for older generation turbo jets and not long enough to allow those jets to operate without weight restrictions. So these challenges are opportunities. Roads. At present, there is no inter-community road network in Nunavut. A business case uh, commissioned by the governments of Nunavut and Manitoba determined that a 1,100-kilometer all-weather road from Rankin Inlet to Manitoba 
could be constructed within 20 years at a cost of 1.2 billion. <clears throat> ports, deep water ports will be required to ship the massive amounts of base metal deposits to international destinations as more mines uh, move into production. Costs of building, maintaining and operating deep water ports are generally recovered through fees charged on the goods shipped through them. All Nunavut communities depend on access to the sea for annual resupply and uh, participation in traditional harvesting. Some communities rely on this access for an emerging and uh, increasingly important commercial fishery. Uh, development of adequate marine facilities would uh, positively affect the, the safety and efficiency of Nunavut's marine activities and enhance the development of commercial fisheries, mine, mineral exploration and development, as well as the, uh, the territory's tourism sector. Uh, communications. Although it has come a long way in the last 12 years, Nunavut's present satellite-based broadband communication service is comparatively slow and expensive. Uh, proposals to reroute fiber optics cable from UK to Asia through the Northwest Passage would reduce the distance and thereby the data transmission latency by up to 30%. Uh, milliseconds of reductions in transcontinental latency can equate to millions of dollars in gains or losses uh, from algorithmic stock market trading transactions. One, one half of its population would uh, benefit directly from uh, this fiber uh, cable proposal, and uh, satellite transponder capacity would be uh, freed up to improve uh, uh, communication performance uh, to uh, the balance of the communities. The development of broadband infrastructure and management tools is vital to Nunavut's economic future. Uh, both to ensure efficient communications and to allow Nunavut to take advantage of emerging opportunities in e-commerce, trade, and export, online training, and promotion of our cultural industries. And this significance is further underscored by the fact that uh, half of Nunavut's population is under the age of 24. Power, power to the people. At present, all power in Nunavut uh, is diesel generated. None of the 25 communities of Nunavut are connected to a power grid system. There are no cross-jurisdictional power transmission lines, and currently Nunavut does not have any hydro facilities. So once again, th these challenges are opportunities for business development, for economic development. Uh, the Chars uh, Cambridge Bay-based uh, Canadian High Arctic Research Station is scheduled to open in 2017. The station will provide a year-round uh, world-class facility for science and technology in Canada's north. Construction has historically uh, been Nunavut's largest uh, industry after uh, public administration. Uh, growth in Nunavut's mining sector combined with a uh, territory-wide housing shortage will accelerate capital expenditures and, uh, and demand for construction in the coming years. Fishing. The landed value of uh, Nunavut fish products exports in 2013 is expected to exceed 100 million, maybe 120, uh, or which is approximately 20% of the territory's uh, private sector GDP. Nunavut's share of shrimp and turbot in its adjacent waters has increased from 10% in 2001 to 72% in 2012. Continued proactive economic development of the fishing sector will support this trend. As of January 23, the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans declared that uh, Nunavut's turbot stock, which is the, the largest uh, portion of the fishing uh, sector, uh, is very sustainable and uh, the total allowable catch is very conservative. Although worker retention has posed challenges, the majority of Nunavut fishermen were not employed prior to training and getting hired in the fishing industry. It has been determined by the Nunavut Fishers, Fisheries Training Consortium uh, that the, the training and work experience improves participants' general employability substantially. Uh, tourism is a growing sector in, uh, in Nunavut's economy and is now contributing more than 40 million per year to the economy, which is largely classified as an export. Nunavut Art holds a uh, world-class reputation as uh, the most rec recognizable uh, 
face of Canadian art worldwide. Let me say in Inuit art, not Nunuit art, just to be. And uh, according to the 2006 census, 5% of Nunuit's labor force uh, has a cultural occupation. And according to the 2010 Economic Impact Study of Nunuit Arts and Crafts, the sector uh, generates 33.4 million annually, leading to more than 1,000 full-time jobs. The Department of Economic Development and Transportation is committed to expanding Nunavut's economy. Uh, we can assist businesses, entrepreneurs, and communities with many activities, uh, from building access roads and floating docks, to prospecting for minerals, to, or purchasing tools uh, to make artwork, There's a variety of funding programs ED &T provides, uh, to which ED &T provides funding to individuals, businesses, organizations, and communities. Today's focus will be on two main business funding programs from ED &T, the SBSB, Small Business Support Program, and SIP, Strategic Investment Program. This information is available online at ED &T's site, so I'm just going to accelerate through it. There's, uh, there's instructions on how to apply to SIP. Just uh, if, if someone's interested in, uh, in uh, applying for funding for one of these programs, contact uh, your economic development officer in your uh, community or your regional ENT office, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll walk you through the process. I just, I just would like to point out, uh, this is core to a, a funding application. Um, it's a sample budget summary, and this is a key piece to any, uh, any funding proposal. Um, in, in the formative and conceptual stages, the project budget for, uh, for funding uses and sources is usually a work in progress. The overall project scope and uh, proposal details typically stem from right here. And it is, of course, critical to the budget that the total costs, as you see on the left, are equal to the total project funding. Um, and uh, EDT works in uh, in concert in collaboration with a variety of other funding sources, uh, which includes Aboriginal Affairs, CANAR, Nuva Research Council, uh, Human Resources (HRSDC), uh, Nuva Development Corp, Baffin Business Development Corp, Nuva Business Credit Corp, Attic Target Corp, Business Development Bank of Canada, Kakavak, Kitikmi at uh, Economic Development Corp. Uh, Kivalik, KPID, and, uh, and regional ins, uh, Inuit associations. Uh, the expenses, the eligible expenses, are, uh, are quite, uh, quite wide and flexible. Buildings, machineries, equipment, services, pilot projects. Uh, one thing that's not eligible is paying off <coughs> debt previously incurred. And uh, In closing, uh, emerging economic development market opportunities in, um, in Inuvut are, uh, are clearly on the rise. And please feel free to, uh, to make use of us at ED&T uh, if you have any interest in programs or technical advice or funding, etc. Thank you. Connor and Amit. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, first of all, let's thank the uh, three presenters. As you, as, you, as you can see, there is three distinct different ways of and doing things for economic development. So maybe we give a, a round of applause, say thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for any of the, the presenters? Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm John Main from the Catalonian Innate Association, and uh, good be for Michael. If you could explain a little bit how uh, how you guys manage your subsidiaries. You mentioned some of them make money and some of them don't. You know, we know there's a balance there. How do you guys, uh, I guess my question is, how do you try to balance the social mandate with the profit mandate, right? Because obviously you're trying to create jobs, 
but you don't want to bleed money all over the place, right? So, clean the me. Look at me, John. Uh, we, I guess, like I said earlier, we create businesses so that they make money. And when they bleed too much, at a certain point you have to cut it off. And we've done that with a couple of our businesses in the past two or three years. Uh, I'll give an example of uh, Nunavik Biosciences, which uh, we worked on quite, uh, quite uh, strenuously in the past five years prior to that. Uh, but we kept uh, losing money each year, so we had to cut it off. Another one, Cruise North. Um, we were told by our partners that we'd be making money at a certain point, but it just didn't uh, end up being that way, so we cut that one off as well. Uh, for In, in uh, good times, I think you can, uh, your threshold for bleeding, I guess. Uh, I guess you can bleed a little more when uh, times are good, but when uh, times start getting tougher and there's less money around, we just can't uh, keep things the way the way they are. Uh, I don't know if I answered uh, your question. Yeah. It was fun to talk to you uh, a couple of nights ago, John. Thank you, Michael. Anybody else? Any any questions or comments? Hello, Ken, Ken Kerr from the Kivalik Mind Training Society, and, and my question's for Michael as well. Um, have you given him any thought to what a reasonable target for Inuit employment in the mining industry could be? Because I think if when we list all the projects, um, you could have every man, woman, and child working in the mine, uh, and yet at, at other times we say, you know, we want 30% or 40% or 50%. Or uh, you know, every every worker coming from the south is bleeding uh, to the economy. But have you, have you given any thought as to what uh, uh, a, a reasonable, challenging target would be? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think reason, reasonable target. Yeah. Uh, in 20 years, a reasonable target might be closer to 100 percent, maybe 50. But today. Uh, at the Raglan mine, I think it hovers around 17%. We'd like it a little higher. We keep pushing for uh, over 20%. Us, as Nunavin Mute, along with uh, the Raglan mines, we work together to try and increase the, the numbers or the percentage. Uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, there's, a, there's a committee I was on called the Tamatumani Committee. It was uh, to promote working, Inuit working in the, in Raglan mine. And it, uh, there were some successes, uh, but uh, a reasonable target, I think at 17%, we can do a little better, but I don't know how much better we can do. Uh, there's always, we have a very young population, like I said, I think that's uh, the case in Nunavut as well. They're not too far away from looking for jobs, so the 17% could be higher in a number of years. Uh, in an ideal world, we'd like 100% uh, rate, but with the education levels and whatnot, qualifications required at the mines, it's uh, not really reasonable. But it's a good, very good question. Thank you, Michael. Anybody else? Let me try. We got a minute or two. I think we're done. Before we go, uh, thank you for coming. And we do have uh, some small gifts to give to the presenters. So could you people just stay till we give them out before you leave? Thank you. Thanks again, and thanks to the sponsor, Kandar and NC, or the Aboriginal Affairs.
Lord and Canada. Bye.